Welcome to Grace Church Online. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us this morning. Whether you're new to Grace or actively a part of our church, we'd like to encourage everyone to take a minute and fill out the digital connect card found as a link attached to this broadcast. This is a great way for us to keep in touch with you if you have any prayer requests, questions, or just want to say hello. Even though we're not able to be together physically, there's a lot of ways you can still stay connected. Groups are still getting together through online meetings. Check in with your group leaders to find out how you can stay connected. Also, make sure to download the Grace app, available on Android or Apple App Store. The app will help keep you in the know about most of the things happening in our Grace community. We want you to know that Kids of Grace programs and resources are available. Just look in the description of this broadcast. There you can find links to the Parent Q app and some video lessons that are just for kids. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you that you love us. Thank you that we get to spend time in your presence this morning. And even though we're apart in our own homes, Lord, I thank you that we can come together as one group, as one church, as your body, worshiping you this morning. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, Grace. We're going to do a song here, but before we do that, I just want to share with you, I know that these times are really strange and, and we can't do the normal routine that we usually do. Sometimes we're, we're used to kind of accomplishing a lot more with our days, or, or maybe we, we feel like we have to do more than what we're able to right now. And I know that for me, I've been really... Uh, I've been really working through that. It's been really hard because I'm used to just accomplishing more. And I'm finding that God is really convicting my heart because what's happening is, is God's kind of showing me that what I produce, what I do, the things that at the end of the day I look back on and I say, yeah, I, I did a lot of good things. And I can kind of check the green box and say I, I was good or I did a good job. Or on the days when maybe I didn't get all those things done and, and I feel like I'm, I've, I've kind of disappointed myself. And sometimes I feel like I've maybe disappointed the Lord. And what the Lord is trying to tell me is that that's not actually true. That my value isn't defined by what I do or what I make or what I produce. My value is defined by Him. And so if you're in one of those places where you're trying to figure out like, you know, what does God think about me since I can't do what I normally do? And maybe you feel frustrated in that. I know that I have. I want to just encourage you with this, this truth. You are, uh, you're not a human doing, you're a human being. <laughs> and God knows that. And he's created you as such. And he sees you where you are. He meets you there. And he's not looking for you to be anything more than what you are right now. You're not a project for God. The project's already been done. In fact, God's already won victory over the project with Jesus. And so what he says is you're enough. You're enough right here and right now to do and to be everything that God needs you to be, to do what he has for you in this moment right now, not 10 minutes from now, not next week, not two months from now, but right now you're enough. And he's enough for you. He's enough with his grace to come and to empower you and equip you to do everything that he's made you to do and called you to do right now. And so this song we're going to do is called The Father's House. But it says, this one line of the chorus is, check your shame at the door because it ain't welcome anymore. And so if you're feeling that shameful guilt of, of not producing what you normally should, or maybe you're not working right now, and that gives you this, this sense of, 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 not, of unworthiness because you're not doing the thing. I want to tell you that God sees you and he meets you where you are and you are enough. You're enough right now. And so let's worship together and let's let God come into those places and convict our hearts and remind us that you're enough. Let's sing together. Sometimes I'll 
on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness Is a canvas for your strength And my story isn't over but My story's just begun Failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does Failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does Jesus' blood 
and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus' name Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm He is Lord Lord seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil encourage you to sing a song out in your own voice to sing your own melody
one with God the Lord most high your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name Christ my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus He didn't want heaven without
what a powerful name. Thank you, Lord, for your powerful name, for the power that you behold, Lord. Lord, we just love you and we thank you for that power, the power that lives in us. Lord, that you would allow your spirit to come in us and breathe in us and give us life. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that you are everything. You are everything that we need and everything that we want. In Jesus' name, amen. To all the ladies at Grace, we want to say that that we love you. We especially want to take a moment and honor all of the mothers. Thank you for, for all that you do. Thank you for all that you have done in these last six to seven weeks, especially all of the different hats that you have have had to wear as uh, employee and mom and teacher and cook and, and all of the ways in which you have shown love to your kids. Uh, We have a a special thing that we want to show you this morning. If we were live and in person here at the church, we would have these little dancers uh, flooding the stage. But the very best we could do is have them dance to some music at home. and, And we put this together as a way of saying, Happy Mother's Day.
Grace Church, I just want to say a big thank you for coming out in huge numbers to our Cinco de Mayo Chewy's Night. There was something like 40-something families that ordered food, and I can't tell you how good it was for my soul to sit there in my little taco hat in my folding chair and wave to you and give you, you know, high fives from eight feet away where we couldn't actually touch each other. But I hope it was as good for you and for your soul as it was for us. It was just almost like a little small sample of what it'll be like when we can gather uh, together again. And so I just want to say thank you to all of you that were able to make it out for that. We also want to let you know that if you're a part of Grace and you are struggling during this time, maybe uh, you and uh, some folks in your family, you've, you've lost your jobs or your hours have been cut, and you've never had to ask for help before, but if you're really, really honest, you could use some help. Uh, we want to be able to help you. We don't have unlimited funds, but we do have a process uh, whereby you can request some help. And we're asking that you would email our missions director, Ted Grusser, admissions at gracefl.org, and he will get you on the right track for this. We are going to keep this confidential and preserve your integrity from start to finish. And if you need help, we don't want you to be afraid to ask for it. We're able to offer uh, help like that because of your generosity. And we want to just say thank you to each and every one of you who have continued your faithful support of uh, Grace Church and the the mission that we have into this community and around the world. And so uh, we thank you for your faithfulness and ask for your continued faithfulness. And if you would like to give, there's all kinds of ways that you can do this. You can give on our church website. You can give through the church app. You can even text to give. And there's instructions on the screen how you can do that. If you say, no, I don't trust any of that electronic business with my money. Well, then you can certainly write a check and put it in an envelope and mail it to 9325 West Newberry Road, Gainesville, Florida, 32606. And we appreciate each and every one of you and all of the different ways that you're finding to give. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give. I thank you for each one who is giving during this time. God, I thank you for the ones who began giving during this time. We've we've seen just new givers for, for the very first time, and we thank you for what you were doing in their lives to encourage that kind of generosity. And so we ask that you would bless each gift and each giver this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Well, good morning and welcome to Grace Church Online. Uh, We are so glad that you're here. Whether this is the very first time that you've joined us, maybe a friend of yours is hosting a watch party and you just clicked on it, we're glad that you're here. If you have joined us over the last six or seven weeks, however long it's been that we've been online, you are welcome as well. My name is Levi Lowry. I'm the assistant pastor here at Grace. And we are in the fourth week of a series called Courage, over fear. And we are looking at some of the passages in the book of Joshua from the Old Testament, and they just seem to make a lot of sense in this season that we are in right now. So in a few minutes, we're going to look at a text in Joshua chapter 6. So if you have your Bible and you want to turn there, go ahead and you can do that right now. But I want to begin by asking you a question. Have you ever been given instructions to do something that when you first heard it, 
it, it seemed silly or it seemed just completely insane. You thought there's no way that this is going to work. Now, I had quite a list to choose from as I began to put a list together of I- insane things in my life, but I still remember almost 20 years ago, the first time I ever heard about the Atkins diet, the low-carb way of eating. I, I was just a couple years out of college. I, I'd put on a little bit of weight that I wasn't comfortable with, and I was talking to some guys that, that I worked with, and they began to tell me that, Levi, you can actually eat a bunch of steak and red meat, all the bacon you want, chicken, uh, any kind of pork, heavy creamer, green vegetables, butter, uh, all of this stuff. And they're telling me that you can basically eat as much of this stuff as you want and you are going to lose a pile of weight as long as you stick to these certain foods. I thought, this absolutely, this makes no sense. I, I was used to hearing about, like, you, you look at the calories, you look at the, the fat content, the saturated fat content, all of that stuff. I thought, this is, this is the craziest thing I have ever heard. But these guys were in better shape than me, and so I thought, I'm going to have a go at it. So I started eating bacon and steak, chicken, pork, uh, non-starchy vegetables, cheese, butter, uh, all of this stuff that had pretty much, I needed to limit in uh, quantity before, And before I knew it, I had dropped like 15 or 20 pounds in a month. Now, the first time I ate a Krispy Kreme donut, it all came pouring back on, but it worked. It actually worked. And I don't think it was just the one Krispy Kreme donut. It It was probably the whole dozen that I ate that did that. But I'm sure you have your own story of some, some wacky antidote that, that you just knew it wouldn't work, but in the end, it did. Now, if you will remember, kind of transitioning here, that God had raised up Joshua to lead his people into the land that he had promised to them. And so he, is, he has been preparing him for this moment uh, up until now. And so we come to this story in chapter 6 where God is going to lead Joshua to overtake the town or the city of Jericho. And many of you know this story. You grew up, if you grew up in church, there were songs that we sang uh, about it, and you probably saw the story come to life on a felt board. But uh, this, is, this is a story that many of us uh, grew up with. And it's, it's what I like to call a one-way story, a one-way conversation, because God is speaking one way to Joshua, and he gives him the instructions about how he is to lead his people into the city of Jericho to to overthrow it. And I'm not going to read the whole passage. I'm going to summarize it here this morning. And what I want you to do is you can gather together a little bit later, maybe over lunch, and you can read the first 15 verses of this story in Joshua chapter 6. But this is what happens. God tells Joshua, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get your fighting men, and I want you to, to line them up, and I want, you, I want you to march them around the city of Jericho one time on the first day. And then I want you to do the same thing on the second day, and then three, four, five, and six. So for six days, I want you to get your fighting men, and I want you to just walk around the city. Then I want you to go back to your encampment. You guys camp out, and you just wait, and then you do it again the next day. He told him, I want you to get the priests, and I want you to give them ram's horns or trumpets, and I want you to have them walk in front of the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God. And so I want you to do this for for six days. And then on the seventh day, you're not going to walk around the city just one time. You're going to walk around that city seven times. Now, scholars believe that it was about nine or ten acres. So it was a pretty good walk, but it wasn't like 50 miles or anything like that. He tells Joshua, once you have done that, you have walked around it seven times on the seventh day. This is what I want you to do. I want you to have all of the priests blow those ram's horns like as loud and as long as they possibly can. And when they've done this, now listen up, Joshua, I want you to have everybody start yelling and screaming really loud, like a war cry, louder than they've ever yelled before. Just have everyone yell. And this is what's going to happen, Joshua. Those big, thick walls that protect Jericho, they're going to just come crumbling down down. Now, some of us grew up with that story, and so maybe we never stopped to think about 
These are, these are real people in a real situation. And this is crazy. This is unconventional at best. And so I told you that this was a one-way conversation in Scripture. But in my mind this week, one of the things I like to do when I'm going to preach a passage is find how many different places can you sit in the text? How many different vantage points are there to, to view what is happening? And so I thought this week, as I was sitting and, and kind of putting myself in the place of Joshua to, to hear these words, I thought maybe these are some things that, that Joshua would have thought or maybe even said if this was more of a two-way conversation because God tells him, I want you to get all of your fighting men and I want you to walk around the city. And I can just imagine Joshua saying, okay, I got it. God, you want us to you get, get all the fighting men and then we're going to walk around the city and then it's kind of like an intimidation thing. When we have them shaking in their boots, then we're going we're gonna to attack. And God's like, no, 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 no. You're not going to attack day one. You're just going to go back to camp. That, that's what you're going to do. And then uh, I want you to have the guys do it again the second day. I can just see Joshua saying, okay, I, I, I got it, I got it. We're just kind of making a statement and making them wonder like what's going on in our minds uh, on the second day. And then as soon as we're done, they're going to think we're just going to run back to camp, but we're not. We're going we're gonna to drop the boom on them, and, and my fighting men, they're going to fight. And I can just see God like saying, no, 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 Joshua, just listen. I want you to have the fighting men and the priests. I want them to do their thing for six days. Just, you're just going to walk around the city, and then you're going to go back to the camp and, and hang out. All right, that's it. But make sure the priests are, you know, they're doing their thing, just carrying the horns. All right, all right. So I can see Joshua saying, God, um, I just want to remind you that the, these are my fighting men. Uh, they're not just... They're not my walking men. Uh, they, they fight, you know, they're, they're, they're strong, they're tough. And all right, so we're just gonna walk. Uh, they're gonna be walking men. Uh, yep, priest, horns, all right. Uh, yep, got it, God, got it. And I can just see God, yeah, but that isn't it. On the seventh day, man, you guys are gonna, you're gonna walk that thing seven times. Remember, blow the horns, and then everybody yells. You know, there's part of me that just wonders if Joshua's thinking, well, okie dokie. This isn't exactly what I had in mind, but we're going we're gonna to just do this and, and see what happens. And I wonder if he had this thought of, you know, I, I hope nobody writes about this because I don't know that I want them reading about this like thousands of years later because this is crazy. And it just doesn't seem like it's going to work. Now, we know, many of us know, that they do it. They do the thing. They march around six days one time, go back, and then the seventh day, they walk around it seven times. The, the priests blow the trumpet. Everybody yells, and then exactly as it was said it would happen, the walls came uh, tumbling down, and then they overtook the city. Now, it's really easy in this story to get caught up in the marching and the walking and the trumpets and the yelling and the walls coming down. But there's, there's an invisible mechanism. There is something in this story that can easily be overlooked. In fact, for us to be reading this story thousands of years later, this invisible trait had to have happened. It had to have happened. And it's this, it's obedience. It's obedience. It's, it's hovering around in the background. It's there, but it's not explicitly highlighted as what's happening. But Joshua was the leader. He was the one that God had chosen. He no doubt had a mind for battle. He had an intellect for strategy. And I think we can forget that in that moment, he had an option. He, he could have chosen to ignore these strange orders from God, and he could have proceeded in his own way. Don't think for a second that that wasn't an option for Joshua on that day. He could have done that. He could have opted to, to keep the priests safely at home. He could have put his soldiers in an optimal formation. And guess what? It's even possible that they still could have conquered the city of Jericho. It's possible that he still could have done it. 
But the temptation would be, if he did it that way, to take the credit and to continue leading these people forward in his own strength. But he didn't do that. He chose the way of God, even though it was unconventional to say the least. See, Joshua was ready for a battle. He was ready to lead a battle. And if you remember, just a few chapters before, God is saying to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Be strong and courageous. He repeats it uh, twice after he originally says it. And so that would seem like a battle was coming. But God did not lead Joshua into a seven-day battle. He led Joshua into a seven-day battle walk. A seven-day walk. A walk around that city. And there's part of me that wonders if on days four, five, and six, if Joshua had doubt. It's not recorded there, but it sure would have been normal. And there, there sure could have been a place for it because this seemed pretty odd. I wonder if he thought in those days, I wonder how many more days my fighting men are going to be okay with this tactic. I wonder what they're thinking of me as their new leader that's supposed to lead them into this promised land. And here we are at our first big test, and all I have them doing is walking around this city. Did I mishear? Did I, did I misunderstand? <laughs> what in the world is going on? Here's the truth. Obedience can be incredibly difficult. Partly because many of us don't like being told what to do. Especially when we are being being instructed or told to do something or use something that is new. That is outside of the comfort zone. Outside of the, the ways and the things that we know. And so when something new comes along, there's many of us that will just buck up against it. We'll rage against that new thing because we place such a high value on our independence. And if we're honest, when we submit to anyone else's authority or idea or instruction, for some of us, it feels a lot like weakness. It feels a lot like losing. Oh, come on, pastor, you're exaggerating things. I mean, we're, we're civilized adults here. Listen, I'm not even talking about just spiritual things. I'm not talking about just things of faith, all right? I have a little example here. How many of you have one of these guys right here? Uh Uh-huh. I don't know if you're on Facebook, but I'm on Facebook, and I have realized that, that this little guy right here has quickly overtaken in Gainesville paper straws as enemy number one, all right? Two months ago, we were all up in arms because we didn't have plastic straws anymore. We had to have paper straws. We were raging against that. And then along comes this little guy, all right? Are you tracking with me? Sometimes we want to buck up against the things that are new. Now get this, the scriptures are full of teachings and commands and admonitions that can rub us the wrong way. I was reading this week in Philippians. and came across this passage in Philippians 2. It says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion— Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, the same love as Christ Jesus, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. I think that for many of us, I can't speak for all of us, but I can, I can speak for myself, that one of the most difficult things in life for many of us can, 
for many of us to do, especially those of us that are fiercely independent, it's to put the needs of others above ourselves, especially when we don't know the other or we disagree with the other on something. But that's not what this says. Like, if, if you agree with the other person, then, then you put their needs above your own. But it says, no, 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 <laughs> that uh, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. And so, when I read that, I'm reminded that, that there, are, there are teachings, there, there are commands, there are admonitions in Scripture that, that are going to rub me the wrong way because they don't come to me naturally. They aren't easy for me to submit to, but I don't get to pick and choose which ones I think are easy and I'll follow those and which ones are difficult and I'm just going to ignore those. See, we pray in the Lord's Prayer, may your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And it's really easy to pray that when we're in church or before a, an athletic event. We, we've almost making it kind of a token prayer sometimes if we're not careful. But, but do we mean those words enough to submit in obedience to the things of the kingdom when they push against our personal desires, our personal beliefs, our long-held philosophies of life, or sometimes against our own common sense. See, we are the way that the kingdom comes to earth, that his will is done. Like, we're the vessel. We're, we're the ones that are poured out into this world. And if we don't respond in obedience, then somebody else is going to have to be that person. Jesus has even stronger words in the book of Luke. The ninth chapter, verse 23. He said to all of them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Sometimes we can be guilty of inviting people to follow Jesus and listing off like all of the benefits. And there are benefits to be sure. But I don't know that too often we point here and say, hey, if you want to follow Jesus, what he's saying is that we need to deny our own desires, our own wants, our own philosophies, sometimes even our own common sense. All of that has to die. All of that has to be put to death. We have to deny those things if we are going to follow him and respond in obedience. And here's the thing. When we look at this verse, we realize that this is not a one-time event in our life. This isn't at the end of a, a, a service where they're, they're playing amazing music and there's a key, chain, a key change and, and we come down to the altar and we pray. We're, we're at VBS and we're, we're in third grade and we raise our hand to accept Christ in our heart. That, that's all good, but what Jesus is saying is that if we want to be his disciple, if we want to follow him, we have to take up the cross daily. And so every single day when I wake up, I end up saying something along the lines of not, not my will, but your will for me. Not a one-time event. This is each and every day that we wake up and put our feet on the ground. See, when we first begin following Jesus, let's be honest, it can seem very counterintuitive. If we didn't grow up in the Christian faith, it can be difficult and it, it can be painful. And sometimes it can just be really uncomfortable. I was reading a blog this week by a guy named Kirk Souza. And he says in Matthew 5, the Sermon of the Mount, which we just went through, is full of counterintuitive lessons. Blessed are the poor, those who mourn and the meek. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If someone slaps your right cheek, turn to him your other cheek. In Mark, the disciples were taught, anyone who wants to be first must be made the very last and the servant of all. And that whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. In Luke, Jesus taught that whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. He taught that those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And so much of this runs counter to the culture of the world that we find ourselves living in. 
And it can be so tempting to ignore the ways of God and forge our own path forward. But listen to this. So often we find peace and comfort once we have consistently submitted in obedience to his ways over extended periods of time. I believe this with everything in me. It can actually become more comfortable to live into God's ways, his teachings, than to rely on ourselves. And when I was thinking of this this week, I was like, what what is an image that gets at this reality? That, That something that can be very uncomfortable at first can become something that is incredibly comfortable, that that we would choose over anything else. And a strange word came to mind, boots. Boots. I actually own two boots, not just one. I have a a whole pair. But I'm going to be honest with you. I am not big on wearing boots. I bought this pair of boots because I did a wedding several years ago when I lived in Texas. And sometimes when you live in Texas and you do a wedding, well, you need a pair of boots. Sometimes boots are just necessary. Now, it's going to come as no surprise to any of you that I have never, ever been mistaken in my life for a cowboy. I live in a neighborhood with privacy fences. We have high-speed internet that that I absolutely love. I can push mow my yard. And I don't know the first thing about saddling a horse. But my father-in-law, Preston, Preston Ponce, on the other hand, that guy loves some boots. He loves some boots. So he's the third born in his big family. And he's kind of, as a third born, had to forge his own way. And so he took early retirement and became a cowboy. He had had horses, but he decided to go all in. And at some point during that process, boots became his footwear of choice. Now, I've never had a pair of boots that I would want to wear for more than, than five minutes. But my father-in-law, Preston, he chooses to wear boots every chance he gets. Well, why does he enjoy wearing boots and can't ma- he can't even imagine that their comfort would be matched? And, and why are my boots, after almost 10 years, still the most uncomfortable piece of footwear that I own? The answer is in time and experience. See, he has spent so much time in his boots. In fact, my father-in-law spent more time in boots this week than I have spent in my entire life. My entire life. Because he was willing to do something that I have never been willing to do. He was, he, he was willing to go through the uncomfortable break-in season of owning a pair of boots. He was willing to do it, and I wasn't. He was willing to submit to the, the rubbing and the friction. And eventually, over time, what began to happen is the boot took shape around his foot. And over time, the irritation disappeared as the boot began to fit in ways that even a tennis shoe never can. That leather began to mold around his foot. And so, and in my mind, in this illustration, it's like God is the foot and, and we are the boot. And in time, when, when we spend the 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 time in close proximity with God, we begin to be transformed into the shape and into the image. And we begin to find comfort in the same place that used to cause pain as we continue to respond in obedience to his leading 
in our life. Now, I know that for some of you that, that can sound kind of cheesy, but, but I really think that it fits here. And, and when I thought about that, and I looked back on this one-way conversation between God and Joshua, and it wasn't even really a conversation, it was just God giving instruction. I believe that Joshua, that he had seen and experienced enough of God, that, that he knew that he could trust his plan. He didn't need to talk back. He didn't need to question God. He simply knew that God would be with him and that God could be trusted. He was comfortable with God in a way that only comes from experiencing his faithfulness over and over again. And so Joshua was obedient. He gave the orders to his people as they were given to him by God. And God showed up on their behalf. And the beauty of this is that, that God has been leading obedient people in unusual ways for thousands of years. People like you and me, see, we're not disconnected from this story. We, we are a part of this God's story. We're just a, a few thousand years uh, ahead now. And so God has been calling people through faithful obedience to do things that they never imagined that they would do. I've watched just in my own life, I've watched him lead people into adoption that never had any intention of adopting a child. But, but God led them and they were obedient. I've, I've seen people begin to foster children when that was never a part of the plan when they first got married. I've seen him lead people to start nonprofit organizations when they have no clue how to, to begin and, and start and run a nonprofit organization. I've seen him lead businessmen and women out of lucrative careers to serve as missionaries and as church workers. I even look at my own family. Uh, I grew up in Atlanta, and my dad had planted a church there in uh, 1977. And I believe it was around 1989, he broke the news to us that uh, he had accepted a call to pastor a church in a neighboring state up in Clarksville, Tennessee. And I remember being devastated because uh, all I ever knew, I wasn't born in Georgia, but it, it was all that I had ever known. And uh, it was just complete and utter devastation. I was halfway through my freshman year of high school. Um, and it was, a, it was a bigger church, and uh, we, we got up there, and that isn't why Dad went. He had been called to 80-something churches, all of them bigger than the church that he was serving at. But he just couldn't shake this one. And obviously, my dad didn't tell me this as we were moving. But, but years later, he revealed in conversation that when he interviewed at that church and he began to talk uh, to other pastors, to uh, superintendents, all the way to the very highest levels of our denomination, to a person, each and every one of them looked at my dad and said, Scott, you need to run, don't walk, run away from that church. They, they, they chew pastors up and they spit them out. You don't, you don't want any part of that thing. And so he listened to that, and he just couldn't shake it. And so we went. And, and I'll be honest, the, the eight years that dad pastored there were, were some of the most difficult years for our family, but it was, it was some of the most fruitful years of ministry that my dad had in a career that spanned five decades it was unbelievable the ways in which God showed up and people's lives were changed and people were called into ministry and they were, they were obeying the, the ways in which God was leading them. Yeah, there'll never be a book written about it, but, but I've seen God show up in my own story, in the story of my family, even in the face of people saying, don't, don't have anything to do with that. When you can't shake that God is calling you to do something, respond in obedience. And Grace, this is good news. Because the same God that was speaking and leading Joshua is the same God that is speaking and leading you and me into unknown futures. And he's simply waiting for us to respond in obedience. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this reminder 
I thank you for this reminder that, that Joshua, as he's just beginning his uh, career, for back, uh, lack of a better term, is your man to lead your people into the promised land. That undergirding this, this magnificent story is obedience. God, I'm so thankful that, that he didn't just forge his own way and that we're here reading about it thousands of years later because he obeyed and you showed up and you led him into that unknown future and you made good on your promise. You made good on your promise. And so Father, I pray for whoever is listening to this this morning, whatever it is that you have been leading them into, been pulling them towards, that, that they have just been, they've been resisting. Uh, they, they've been trying to do it maybe in their own way. That this could be one of those days when they simply submit. Submit to you in obedience. Father, I pray that you would show up in big ways and in small ways as your people respond to you in obedience. In Christ's name, amen. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. There's a table that you prepared for me In the presence of my enemy It's your body and your blood shed for me This is how I fight my battles There's a table that you How I fight my battles And I believe you've overcome And I will lift my song Of praise for all you've done This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles This is how I fight my battles this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. In the valley, I know that you're with me. Surely, your goodness and your mercy follow. My weapons are praise and thanksgiving. This is how I fight my battles. Yeah, yeah. And I believe you've overcome. And I will lift my song of praise for all you've done. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Well, this is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. 
So may the grace of God be upon you to empower you to do all that he has made you for. May you go in the peace that passes all understanding. We love you. We miss you. And we will see you back here online 